Listen. Hello and welcome to NBC IGN's Nintendo Podcast. I'm your host, Casey DeFridis, and today I'm joined by Jack, Zach Ryan. Jack Ryan. Jack, Jack Ryan. <laughs> Gosh. Tom I was Clancy's. thinking like Paris finally back from Japan. Jack I'm back. Ryan. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> and Tom Marks. Hello. Hey, happy birthday, Tom. I didn't Wait, expect what? to uh, hear our jingle and it totally threw me off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Usually no one can hear it. It's only for you guys. Yeah. Where did that come from? I don't know. Amazing. I'm so yeah. confused now. Nice. Where did that come from? <laughs> It's good to have it. We'll never know. There's mm -hmm. no way to know, right? Oh, God. But hey, so this week we're going to be talking about a ton of Pokemon stuff, of course, because Game Informer had a huge exclusive. Um, I'm not salty at all. You're salty. Um, <laughs> we're also going to be talking a little bit about Nintendo's mobile strategy and if it's working, because we finally got a review out for Mario Kart Tour. And, like, way too much news. Just all of the news. It's a lot of news this week. Yeah. But first, Pear, you're back from Japan. I'm back. I went to Japan to to deliver my first child to a foreign nation. My daughter is studying. As in, is uh, Japanese custom. <laughs> she passed Japanese custom. She's uh <laughs> she is um she's studying in, in Tokyo, so you uh -huh. know, it's bittersweet. Uh, so I spent some time there with uh, her and my wife setting her up and going to various government offices. And of course ate way too much food, ate, drank way too much and explored all of Tokyo again. I went to college there when I was a, a wee young lad. I brought you guys some stuff. Just tiny little things. Gifts, gifts, yeah. gifts, yeah, gifts. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Let me see. I got I got my my beautiful little gift bag here. Like um, look at all those brands. Um, uh, I have something for Brian Altano, but he's not here. Not on the so show like, this week. Well, I'll give it to him later. For Brian, I have a, uh, the latest Mario candy uh -huh. and a, a notepad made from pepperoni. Okay, good. So, yeah, <laughs> like literally really made like from pepperoni. No, it no, just looks literally. like pepperoni. Uh, for for you, because I know your favorite game character, I got you. Um, Kirby gummy candy, ah! so, uh, and then the newest pink Kit Kats. Japan has, this crazy, Japan has this crazy thing about having different Kit Kats in yeah. every town, but this is different. This is a uh, new cranberry one. Ooh, cranberry Kit Kats. I actually really like the cranberry Kit Kats. For uh, Casey, because she, I like her favorite thing is to eat things that are made out of Pokemon. <laughs> uh -huh. These are like uh, new Pokemon waivers. Uh, they're really beautiful, and I've got you. Uh, I've got you a little ice cream sticker so you, you can so customize much. your waivers with. That's really good. Oh, uh, and then for my very special friend. Oh. I've got, uh, so I got you a bacon notepad. Okay. So you can write on bacon so people know the messages from you. And I, and I got you candy too. These are uh, special gummies. They're uh, poo poo to, poo poo to gummy. It's actually the, uh, the Ushiri Tante, that's the butt detective. Uh -huh. So they're all butt shaped candies <laughs> and turd shaped candies. I think you will like them. Wow, Pear. Thank you very what, much. What I flavor? feel like you're really. Uh, you're really trying to tell me something here. I gotta with be this. honest. I saw yeah. those first. I'm like, Zach's getting those. <laughs> <laughs> what flavor are the the butt shaped candies? I don't uh, know. The, the butt and turd flavor. I, don't, I no, hope they, not. I'm sure they're delicious. Chocolate. You're our anyway. very own Japanta Claus. Zach. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Zach, you need Thank to open you. that and oh, taste man. the butt. I'll do it. I'll do it. <laughs> Give us a taste. taste test right now on air. This is a thing that all podcast listeners love is it's, when people eat them. Yeah, make lots of nasty noises. Is He's it eating the butt. butt flavor or what is it? Tastes like strawberry. All okay. Right. Yeah. Shiri tante tastes like shitty tante. Oh shitty. <laughs> oh okay. shitty means butt. Okay, got it. Oh shitty. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. That's He's the good. word of the day. <laughs> That's it. Now I can leave and go back to Japan. You're pretty good. So let's move on to our first topic, which is our biggest topic, <laughs> and that is, is Nintendo's mobile strategy working? So mm. we got a couple that of... That one was peach. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, good, it's, good. I yeah. can smell oh, it. Oh, because it's a butt. Because it's yeah. a butt. It's oh. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe they're all peach. Sense. Yeah. Peach. Peach flavored butts. <laughs> anyway, there's a bunch of articles that went up this week um, or last week about Nintendo's mobile games. Um, mm. There's one by um, Imran and one by Joe Scrubbles. And we also got the review from Mario Kart Tour. It got a 6.7. Wow. Um, so low or high? No, I mean it's the <laughs> lowest rated Mario Kart game in the history of Mario Kart reviews on this website. Mm. And the basic sum of that is that the racing it feels good, but the microtransactions and the cost of it it makes it bad. Not great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also the fact that it's uh an exclusively single player experience yes, currently. A hundred percent. It it like just limits some of the replayability because you know, playing against bots in Mario Kart alone is only fun for so long. 
Yeah, but I'm really crushing it out there every race, so I feel pretty good about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, look, the core mechanics and the look and everything, and you guys talked about this. We don't need to go into this again. Are, are pretty good, right? I, I wasn't on last week, so I didn't get to give too many impressions. Like, I actually, I think that the racing is actually pretty fun, and it's yeah. a great little yeah. time waster. But yeah, that, it, I kind of play it the way I play all Nintendo mobile games. It's like when I remember that it's there and I have 10 minutes to kill, I boot it up, and it's mm -hmm. totally passable. So Yeah, yeah. it's uh, fine. And instead of talking about specific game for this conversation, let's talk about the overall direction of Nintendo's mobile game strategy because when I was looking back at the history of Nintendo's games I completely forgot that Miitomo existed oh yeah for example mm -hmm. um, I don't even remember how they monetized that did you have to buy accessories I think maybe so I don't remember I didn't play it long enough for monetization to really come yeah play. I, didn't I remember either. I messed with it for about the first week or so that it was mm -hmm. out and then dropped off yeah to, to me Miitomo almost feels like a different generation or a different so. world of Nintendo yeah. mobile games. Like it feels like Mario Super Mario Run. Was Miitomo after a Super Mario Run? Before. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. I think Super Mario Run kind of and what came after it marked like a shift in in what the company does with games on mm -hmm. mobile. Mm. And I I wanted to mention so in 2015 um Iwata in an interview with Time said we want more people to become familiar with Nintendo IP through Nintendo smart device game apps and that was their goal with mobile games. It was basically to make them advertisements to bring in the casual audience that were on mobile phones to get familiar with Nintendo IPs and then to want to play those games on the actual Nintendo consoles. And I feel like Animal Crossing is probably the closest to that vision, right? Like it's a limited version of Animal Crossing that you can play and enjoy. And it kind of makes you feel like you want a little bit more. And then the real Animal Crossing game could expand on it and carry people over. But then, and, and Super Mario Run is kind of I was going like to say, that too, I feel right? that way about Super Mario Run. I've, I've talked a lot about how much I love Super yeah. Mario Run on this show. But uh, yeah, I do feel like that's a, a good gateway drug for both of those franchises, whereas something like Fire Emblem Heroes is a gotcha game and is less like the core mechanic of yeah. any of the Fire Emblem games. But, so. but that's the thing. So like Fire Emblem looks great and is familiar to people who play on mobile. Like that is mm -hmm. the mobile kind of route that all mobile games go through, whereas mm -hmm. Super Mario Run is what uh, core gamers are used to. You play a set, um, you pay a set price and then you get the full game, mm -hmm. but that doesn't speak to mobile players. So they saw that and weren't familiar with it and maybe didn't want to do it. And mm -hmm. maybe that's why um, Mario Kart Run, not Mario Kart Run, Mario Run didn't do... <laughs> Mario Kart Run. Um, <laughs> no. It's just Mario Kart, but no, no carts. Just no. everyone's just running. Mario Kart Tour. Mario Kart Tour. Super Mario Super Run Mario made Run. $74 million estimated. Yeah, to date. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So obviously, that's not bad. No. Right? no. Not bad. It's also nothing near Fire Emblem, yeah, which is with its $618 that's million. That's exactly it. And so bearing the lead there, you know, like... The most full-fledged fledged game on the service is probably Dr. Mario World, right? Like, that is the game that is closest to its counterpart on other platforms, right? Because it is, it has lots Puzzle of level. Yeah. It changed up the mechanics a little bit, but, like, that's a self-enclosed experience. Whereas the other ones, and maybe Dragalia lost, but, like, the other ones are more kind of still like companion games. But Fire Emblem really functions like functioned like a uh, Japan or China-made mm -hmm. um mobile game one mm. and like and you can see the the money it's making um what's really funny about like their nintendo's mobile strategy definitely changed um from the original introduction by mr iwata right like they're trying different things now and then with every game they they subtly changed how they're monetizing these, these games dr mario world's actually a huge failure i think not from a you know i'm sure it makes its money back because it's not a big like investment uh, development investment but puzzle games have ruled on mobile platforms mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know like uh, a lot of the the kind of bigger mainstream puzzle games have made so much money and for them to kind of choke on a Mario branded puzzle game is pretty remarkable. And that's something that Joe actually said in his recent piece, which is really, really great, um, where he was saying, like, even if you don't consider any of the microtransaction stuff, even if you kind of cut that whole narrative out of it, Dr. Mario World is just not nearly as good of a puzzle game as something like Grindstone, which just came out for Apple Arcade, which right. is we've been talking about in the office nonstop yeah. since Apple Arcade came out. And if you look at something like that, 
yeah, like puzzle games and games like Dr. Mario World mm -hmm. should be doing well uh, and should be extremely popular. And it kind of just landed with a thud. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I, I would I would say that each and every game that Nintendo put on the platform has a counterpart that does things better, right? Like if you think of games like Jetpack, Joyride, or Candy Crush, or all these mm -hmm. games, like people always dismissively talk about Candy Crush, but that core game is so addictive and so well constructed that I, do you keep eating butts? I think smell butts, delicious. Right? He's Speaking. crushing some Very candy. Very peachy. Uh, no, but like, but it's. I think for for first time in a long time, Nintendo is kind of like a little bit off its game on this platform in that they're not the one creating something where everybody goes, "Wow, that's really different and unique and like top." Like, uh, kind of like they're no longer the most charming developer in the club. Others mm -hmm. are kind of outperforming them a little bit. And like, even others that they're used to working with, like HAL Laboratories came up with a uh, part-time UFO, oh, which yeah. I think is a really lovely little yeah. uh, pay once and just get it mobile game. Yeah, I think Nintendo's strategy to their mobile approach is a little archaic. It feels a little like mobile games circa like 2011, 2012, yeah. in that the, the way that they, they're monetizing things. And I think it turns a lot of gamers off, not maybe when it comes to the gotcha style games of like Dragalia Lost or Fire Emblem, because obviously those are just like printing money. But in some of these other instances, like Super Mario Run, like Dr. Mario World, I think it's kind of a miss on their part to not monetize them in a more contemporary manner. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. but Mario Kart, I think, is definitely the odd game out here in that that game does not communicate well enough why you should be spending five bucks a month, right? Mm -hmm. And like, mm -hmm. I think you can have plenty of fun with that game without pay paying a dime. And I think for that, you know, it's 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 already um, <laughs> it's already Zach keeps on eating the <laughs> gross candy. Um, for it's that, delicious. you know, you, we, we should laud it for that too. It makes a, it creates an enjoyable Mario Kart experience for those people who don't want to pay anything yeah. either. But then it has this weird subscription plan, like kind of put on top of it at a time where other subscription plans offer so much more, and like the value is not clear. I'd very, I'd be very interested to see, and this is a world we don't live in, so it's never, it's only something we can speculate on. But I'd be very interested to see what the launch of Mario Kart Tour looks like if it literally just didn't have that subscription service? Like, what would we be talking about? So I'm, you know? in, I'm also interested in that, but I, I'm curious to see what their marketing campaign even really looks like because I was playing it in the theater last night waiting for a movie to start, and somebody sitting behind me was like, are you playing Mario Kart on your phone? Like, how are you uh, doing that? You know, and it's like, I wonder if people outside of core Nintendo fans know about these mobile efforts in the way that like we're plugged into it, like our audience is probably plugged into it, right? Are people having to actively search for this stuff on the app store to find them or is Nintendo even doing a good enough job to say like, hey, these are out now on this platform? Think about how much money Apple is spending right now on promoting arcade. arcade. And Nintendo releases a game at the same time mm -hmm. for the same amount of money monthly that's not part of arcade. Mm -hmm. And yeah. like, I understand they, you know, like Wires Cross there, this game, they wanted to monet test monetization in a different way and it couldn't have been part of a service where there are no microtransactions. So you get paid a lump sum from Apple mm -hmm. for its inclusion. But like, this was the worst possible timing. It's hey, do you want to just mention like the ranking of games and how much they made made for Nintendo? I think it'd be interesting to people. Yeah, sure. So, so far, so it it's not not making the money. Like the mobile games are still <laughs> mm -hmm. doing fairly well. Um, but as we know from a previous interview, we know an employee from Cy a cyber agent employee, someone from Side Games, has said Nintendo is not interested in making a large amount of revenue from a single smartphone game. And the reason we extrapolate that is because they put limits on Dragalia Lost. They had the opportunity to change the way that worked to make more money. And they said, no, we don't want to be that exploitative. Don't do it. Um, so Nintendo isn't, you know, just trying to make a cash cab out of this. But with this in mind, Fire Emblem has made six hundred and eighteen million. Astounding! That's um, great. That's a huge amount of money. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Animal Crossing has made one hundred and eleven million, and out of the so the first fifty million that that game made, eighty percent of that revenue came from Japanese players, which mm -hmm. I thought was very interesting. Um, Dragalia Lost has made one hundred and six million. Super Mario Run has made seventy four million. Mario Kart Tour has made two million, and Doctor Mario World has made one point eight, which I think is the most interesting because Doctor Mario World has been out for way longer than Mario Kart Tour. Yeah, for sure. yeah but and these uh, Mario Kart is so much more a recognizable franchise than Doctor Mario. Yeah, yeah, it is. And these numbers come from uh, a site called Sensor Tower, yes. and they were from I believe September twenty seventh. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Mario Kart Tour had only been out for a few it's, days at that point, yeah. right? It made a ton of money really quickly, and I would not be surprised to see that number go up 
very, very fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see. I'm very curious to see where this is going to be sitting next year compared to the rest of the Nintendo's yeah. mobile games. But do you think Nintendo should change something? Is the way that they're handling Mario Kart Tour against what Iwata said in 2015? That's an interesting thing because it's, well, first of all, you want to be respectful, right? Like you don't want to put the words in some of, in someone else's mouth who's passed on, especially someone who's very venerated. Like you got to be careful with all of that sort of speculation, but there are, and I'll try to pull them up because there are some really interesting quotes from Iwata talking specifically about like things like he said, I've come to realize that there is a degree of insincerity to consumers with the terminology free to play, since so called free to play should be referred to more accurately as free to start, which is what they've actually been mm-hmm. doing. They've been calling them free to start games. Mm-hmm. Um, but he also had a quote uh, somewhere along the lines where he, he mentioned, you know, like, if we're not careful, basically he was saying, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he was basically like, if we're not careful, we'll be we'll devalue our brand and That's we'll devalue our games. Right. That's from GDC. He, yeah. Well, the, during his GDC keynote, he was he was sounding the alarms for the traditional traditional game development community that the game the games would be devalued by mobile. Yeah. Right now, and it, it's interesting to see how part of that part of what he was saying they're very clearly taking to heart, and other parts it feels yeah. like. Mario Kart and Dr. Mario have been devalued a little bit by some of the practices that they've done with these mobile games. Yeah, but I think to Casey's original question, like, do we feel like this falls in line with his original philosophy about Nintendo on mobile? I think it's a 50-50 split, right? Mm. Like, I think that it is doing a good job of introducing these franchises to an audience that might not necessarily have been familiar or uh, as committed to Nintendo properties, you know, as they are on mobile, especially in Japan. Um, And secondarily, like, oh, yeah, they're making a little money on the side. So, like, it's not a tremendous amount. It's not, like, billions and billions of dollars, but it is enough money to say, like, hey, this is a decent investment and we should continue doing this kind of work. Yeah. I, I mean, I have not met anyone in the mobile business uh, with a platform holder or developer who thinks this this $5 subscription plan is a great idea. No. For the mobile platform. It's, it's a really for Mario Kart, weird... For Mario Kart, for Mario Kart it's absolutely it's insane. It's a really weird... It's a very weird approach to to mobile gaming, but also to Nintendo's own IP. Now, in the end, like, if the game were a full-fledged game like a Mario Kart 8, right, like, if you paid for it for a year, you would be paying the same as you'd pay for that, right? And so, like, you could argue, like, hey, if I only play this game for a month, five bucks, that's nothing. But there's this implication that you could continue to pay and they're pricing it like an MMO, a game that gives you new quests all the time. But it's it's also it's really al- weird. It's also not sustainable because there's only a, there's a finite amount of cart, mm. uh, carts and um, parachutes and courses right. and characters that that you can really pull from from mm. previous games, uh, and you're going to run out of those in the course of several months, right? If they're introducing X amount of courses or carts or characters each month, it's like you can only go for so long before it's like I'm paying five dollars for what additional stuff yep. like. I feel like it's a, it, they're going to add things that make the things you already have almost obsolete. The that's only thing that I'd what be all to mobile pay games that much do for though is new new courses. Yeah, like I I, th- I think they were or Roy. I think they they <laughs> wanted to be careful. They know there's legislation out there. And they know there's a lot of discussion around loot box mechanics right now, and they wanted to propose a different sort of monetization setup. And, uh, you know, like just maybe they were being a little bit careful about implementing the strategy that everybody else would have used on this game to make money, right? Which is more of a loot box structure. You think, so. you think people are playing this game in like Brussels, Bel- Belgium, where loot boxes they, are outlawed? Or well, they the can with, is, yeah. uh, with a subscription plan. They could, for is, sure. Is, does gotcha not count as loot boxes under that law? You know what I mean? I think it is. I, d- yeah, I think it's. Um, I think it. I don't know because I think the basis of that law is about the randomization of the reward. Yeah. So that's, that's what just is. what Tour has as well with its firing yeah. pipes. Okay. Yeah, and like uh, there's news. Obviously, some games are changing, right? Like there's the. Uh, uh, what do we got? Um, we've got the. Uh, oh. You can get there. Come on. <sighs> uh, a car car soccer game. Why am I not? Rocket, Rocket League. League. <laughs> Rocket League. Sorry, I've not been speaking English car for soccer. a while. The uh, car soccer so, game. So Rocket League is changing their loot box mechanics to be blueprints, so you can right. actually see what you're getting before you're, you know, you're you're actually making making the item. And so, like, I think we'll see a lot of changes. Uh, I don't think this one is it. Yeah. So, if uh, you're listening or watching, let us know what you think about Nintendo's mobile game strategy so far in the comments, and what you'd like to see change or not change. Very, I'm, I'm interested. 
So let's move on to some news, which we have a lot, and I don't even know if we're going to get through all of it, but we're going to try. Um, new Age, um, New Brain Age has been announced for Japan. Which hey. That's great. I think, I feel like we just mentioned this in the office. It's like, whatever happened to Brain Age? Because <laughs> it was so popular on the DS. And then oh, we we're definitely mic'd. Yeah, they, yeah, they've got us mic'd. You know what happened? <laughs> Nintendo made Brain Age games, everybody played them on the DS, and then Everybody else made game uh, brain age games and Nintendo on the went, web browser. Well, okay, now it's not fun anymore. Yeah, <laughs> like basically, <laughs> yep. yeah, just right? a bunch of browser-based uh -huh. clones. Yeah, yeah there, so sure. many. Even on PlayStation, you had like Kawashi, like a Doctor Kawashima game mm -hmm. and stuff. Like mm -hmm. they were everywhere because Nintendo obviously doesn't own the Doctor, so the Doctor was free to do what doctors do and meet a lot of people. Wait, mm -hmm. was he real? Yeah. What? Yeah. yeah. I never knew that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you oh I thought he was your brain character. for just nine ninety nine an hour. <laughs> No, he of course he's real. I had no idea that was based on a real person. Mm -hmm. I just I, thought it was. I actually like... don't know if he's real, but like, everybody <laughs> says he's real. real. So yeah. So the new Brain Age game is going to get an official Switch stylus. It's coming December twenty seventh, but for Japan, it hasn't been. Yeah. It'll come to the it'll states come eventually. Yeah. It'll be it'll be a U.S. release. We have well. way worse brains than uh, the people. I of for one welcome Japan. this new Brain Age game so. because my brain has been very mushy of late, That's and right. I'm ready to whip it into shape. I I'm, imagine a Brain Age game or a game like this is also a little more involved to localize. Probably, yeah. and maybe that's just a guess, but like you're writing different words or numbers in a lot of cases. It's just like a lot of, there's probably a little more that mm. gets involved in it. I don't know. I can't speak to that. I don't know. I, I'm guessing. This is yeah. not an experience. We have the same it. numbers. Well, <laughs> but they have itch, knee, san. We weren't yeah. using the kanji, but no, but there was some localization. I played the Jap, I actually own the Japanese version of Brain Age. I got to bring it in. We can see there's, mm. there are okay. definitely, I know there were differences with uh, voice recognition with that game and some challenges. Ah. Remember that? You were, no. you, you could say out the words for them to uh, okay. recognize them. Yeah. I don't remember that. Yeah. You could go like yellow, red. Hmm. All, that, all that part of my brain has just gone yeah. away. See? There's no brain age. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'll have to do it. But uh. this one is going to use the uh, IR sensor to detect your hand in rock, paper, scissors, apparently. Mm -hmm. Another <laughs> game that won't work on the light. <laughs> oh, oh no. dang. Yeah. That's a good point. Well, Anyway, excited to train our brain with the new mm -hmm. brain age. It's cool that there, there's a stylus, too. That's, like, mm -hmm. weirdly exciting. <laughs> this time next year, this, this panel will be so smart because of new brain age. That's mm -hmm. right. And mm -hmm. everyone listening and watching will be, not going to make too. mistakes anymore. <laughs> Rocket car. Rocket car game with soccer ball. All right, guys. I Two. am very excited about all of these new Pokemon details, and I yeah. want to get into them. So Game Informer visited Game Freak and was able to speak with them about a ton of different things. They did their classic, um, I think like 99 rapid fire questions, which are great. And we got a bunch of details out of it. Pear's gonna eat the butt now. Tom and I have also eaten butt. butt. Mine wasn't a butt, mine was a little dude. It's like a oh, little guy. A little yeah. guy, a Please, butt guy. Please continue. Okay, butts. Um, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that really threw you off. Oh no. Um, so just to reiterate, uh, the national dex is not gone forever. Um, they wouldn't answer whether national dex would all be included in Sword and Shield, but there will be games in the future that will include all of the Pokemon, or at least, you know, we'll be getting Pokemon that aren't in Sword and Shield that will be in future games. Pokemon Home is a testament to that. Don't worry, your, I don't know, Doduo isn't trapped forever in your previous game. Yeah, you're right. Um, Odoo is not making a cut. That's actually a good guess. <laughs> so autosave, um, so we noticed this in the last trailer, autosave has been confirmed and it also was confirmed that you could turn this feature off. Mm -hmm. So you can choose to rely solely on manual saves or you can have autosaves on and then use both, which is great. It's the best of both worlds. So people like Brian who forgot that you had to manually save won't have to worry about it. And people like me who want to catch legendary Pokemon over and over again until I get the right nature, I can still do that. So that's and, great. <laughs> yeah, this when we talked about this autosave news and speculated on it way back when, when mm -hmm. it first kind of got noticed, this is exactly what I was saying I wanted, right? Mm -hmm. Is just like as many options as they can give. And that is what we have is mm -hmm. you can have it on, you can also manually save with it on, you can turn it off. It's like, this is just exactly what they needed to do. So I'm really, really happy about that. Exactly. And about me repeatedly trying to catch legendary Pokemon to get the right nature, they talked a little bit about making all Pokemon viable. <laughs> Go on. Go on. Um, so they said that there will be new systems that will keep early Pokemon viable, and it de-emphasizes uh, breeding. But it sounds like there will be a nature changer mm. at some point in the game because they said there is a personality parameter that can make it so 
Pokemon are not viable, which was exactly the case. Like I would go through the game and collect my party and not really worry about if they're competitively viable. And then at the end of the game, how this team of level 60 Pokemon with the wrong nature and the wrong IVs and like not EV trained properly, I'd have to start all over. So they said they're implementing things to make those Pokemon viable and competitive uh, scene. They said specifically, we're doing a lot of stuff in the back end, introducing systems that allow players to make sure that Pokemon they want to use in competitive competitive battles are viable. And this includes Pokemon that might have sentimental value from to you from previous games that you port into here and maybe can change their stats mm. somehow. Um, they said there will still be value in breeding, so that's not totally being taken away, but it's go it sounds like it's going to be easier to make all Pokemon viable. I think that's great. I mean, mm -hmm. like the, with a lot of games that have memorable characters, you know, and like I, I would argue a lot of the Pokemon are really mem memorable. Um, I went to the Pokemon Center in Tokyo and like there were people storming in and running all to different plush versions of the Pokemon, right? Like everybody's got their favorites and nothing is worse than knowing that the shape and the character of the Pokemon you like is not equal to its performance in battle and all of that. So I think that's really smart they're doing yeah. that. That I don't know if they're going to change. I feel like, like for example, Lipard is still not going to be viable no matter you think so? how great its IVs, EVs, and nature is. But I don't think it's going to change their their stat potential. I I don't know? I don't think you can ever balance everything. Yeah, no, it's impossible. You know, like, just not, like in Smash Brothers, there like will always be a winner that people flock to, but I, at least they're trying. Yeah, especially not with like hundreds and hundreds of... Potential no, there's characters, way too many. right? There's like, way too many. To there's no way you can out. balance those all out. Yeah. But I, I think that's one of the reasons why they're limiting um, the amount of Pokemon in Sword and Shield because that way they can reasonably, possibly balance it for competitive play if they're only dealing with 150 or so Pokemon and not more than 800. <laughs> so yeah. I don't know. Well, there's there. But we also know that there are, are now 18 gyms in Pokemon Sword and Shield, and they're split between Major and Minor League, uh, depending on the game, will decide which league that oh, gym is in. Oh, that's 18 across 18, both games? No, 18 total. 18 in, in okay. a game. Yeah. Right. Some of those are Major League gyms, and some of them are Minor League gyms, mm -hmm. and depending which is which is dependent on if you get Sword or Shield. Yeah. And that's a lot, because usually there's only eight gyms. Yeah. yeah. It's there's a ton. ton. So some pretty cool announcements. Mm -hmm. It's especially cool because the gyms look really cool yeah. in this game. Dude, we we played the um, water type gym at yeah. E3 and at Gamescom, and like it had a really cool puzzle solving mechanic built onto it on on top of the battle mechanic, which like, I really dug. I thought that was really cool. Mm -hmm. Made it like its own little dungeon. Yeah, I, and I have to think about all this stuff because I don't know how how I feel about some changes like the equal. Uh, the equal uh, uh, stats the, and the uh, experience and all that oh, stuff. Oh, yeah, the experience share. Yeah. Um, I don't know how I feel about that either. So yeah. they removed the experience share, and that doesn't mean your Pokemon won't have experience share. Automatically, all Pokemon will get the same experience in your party, regardless if they battled or not. And in A Big change. Yeah, and in Sun and Moon and X and Y, you would get the item, and then you could turn it on or off. So you could artificially increase your difficulty by keeping it off, but it doesn't sound like that is an option in Sword and Shield. I actually really love that because, like, I have, uh, you know, and like several older JRPGs, you can have six party members, but only three can be in your party at any given time. And the idea that they all level up together so that in the instance that you need to swap somebody mm -hmm. out or like want to try a different character, like I like the idea that those characters are also being leveled up along with you so that you don't have to like go back and grind yeah. with one specific set of like, I don't know, like maybe I want to start a whole dog army of Pokemon, but all dogs aren't equal. I can't get out there and train them all together. So yeah, it just removes a little bit of that it removes one more kind of skill factor, right? Like, in order to evolve a magic carp, you have to swap them in, mm -hmm. and like that, that. With that gone, it just becomes something that anyone can do by just carrying something. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Like, I I don't love that, but um, I'm I'm sure there are lots of people who like once you start playing, it can become tedious to mm -hmm. level up uh, underpowered ones. Yes, and it becomes a chore, and you know, like I like that they're trying to find a solution for it. Yeah, on but one I hand... I thought an item was a better solution. Yeah. On one hand, I, I totally agree with Zach. I Thank you. super appreciate that feature in JRPGs, especially mm -hmm. if they're not in my party and they're in the, you know, in the wings, and I can just switch them in maybe for the next dungeon or wherever I'm going. But for Pokemon, I never... I, I guess I never considered Pokemon as your traditional JRPG, and maybe we should, and appreciate the 
the features that have been included in more modern JRPGs that are now being included in Pokemon just mm-hmm. accept it? Is it as it evolving? Ah, <laughs> but I'm fish. Um, <laughs> Lastly, um, HM, HMs are not returning, just like in Pokemon Sun and Moon. Good. Um, yeah, uh, that's great. That's all we need to say about that. <laughs> Yay, no no HMs. And uh, we also learned that max raid battles were inspired by Pokemon Go, as we assumed. And they will have difficulty levels. And we were told, not we were told, but Game Informer was told to not expect to just walk into these raids and just be able to beat them. And that they will be some of the mo- more difficult challenges in the Pokemon series as a whole. Now, these raids are like multiplayer raids like Pokemon mm-hmm. Go, right? Yep. I think that's the most intriguing part to me of this whole game. Like, I keep I keep forgetting that Sword and Shield is coming out this year. Mm-hmm. And then, it's like, like a month and a half every away. time that, I know, every time that we start talking about it again, there's something that, like, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's really cool. That's a really cool new thing about this one in particular because, like, obviously, I'm a pretty casual Pokemon fan, but there are aspects of this one that I am really excited about. And that's also one of the reasons why they implemented autosave features, because in previous games, if you wanted to trade or interact with someone, you'd have to go through the saving mechanic before doing that. And now it'll just do it in the background. And when you interact with someone, you won't have to go through the motions of doing that again. Yeah. Which is really nice. So, yeah, that's about a ton of new details um, from Pokemon Sword and Shield, from Game Informer. There's a lot. I think more on the way, too. Yeah, more on the way. We'll we'll see. Mm. We'll keep you updated. Of course. As long as I'm here. If I'm not here, I can't promise you anything. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, FIFA 20 Legacy Edition for the Nintendo Switch, the review came out, and it didn't do great. It got a four. Yeah, Simon Cardi. That's worse than the previous FIFA on Switch. Well, he actually says this year's subpar version of FIFA for Switch is almost indistinguishable from last year's subpar version of FIFA for Switch. And that's like a quote from Simon Cardi's review over in the UK. Um, it, the the weird thing about this is that they said that the Legacy Edition explicitly they were like this doesn't have any new modes and any new gameplay changes whatsoever. It is the same game as nineteen, but with an updated, updated roster, roster and some updated UI, and that's it. Yeah, and they and were very an, upfront about that and an updated price. Yeah. And oh no. And so it was fifty dollars. Yeah. And there were fifty US dollars, and it's like man. uh, Simon called it a macro transaction Uh, and he said in his review there's honestly no genuine reason I could give you to purchase FIFA 20 on Switch if you already own FIFA 19 on Switch and basically he was just saying it's literally the same game but for a full game price and you kind of just shouldn't put up with that if you already have it. I'm of two minds about it. I like that at least EA was upfront in branding this obviously saying hey this is a legacy edition but like I don't think I don't I think there's some people who are not that discerning and won't look closer. So somebody already owned FIFA 19 might buy this and go, "Oh, it is the same game. It just has updated rosters, mm-hmm. right?" Which honestly should just be a $10 roster mm-hmm. update for FIFA 19. Yes. They do put that information explicitly on the back of the box. So they do tell you that this version <laughs> is the same as 19. That's a bold and marketing they have move. Yeah. It says no new gameplay features. Jesus. Because all of EA's marketing for FIFA is about the Volta mode, right? Like this right. new thing that you can get on the other platforms. This is so weird. I mean, it's like I understand Switch owners don't buy these games at a high enough level for them to perhaps go the extra mile and port all these new features right there, like spend a lot of time on getting a parody and maybe de- delaying some of the other versions in order to launch at the same time. But like this is obviously not the way to... Create games for Switch. No, it's it's really pretty lame, I think. Super and then they lame. wonder why their games don't do well. And and the, the, essentially the nicest thing you can say about it is what you said, which is like, to their credit, they went, hey, this is super lame, but we're doing it, right? Like, that's basically the best thing you can say about it is that they weren't just, like, deceptive. They were very upfront and, with the lame thing they were doing. And I'll tell you, you know, I, I spoke to somebody at EA off the record. Oh, boy. And I cannot name names. But, I, you know, I quoted the, uh, the, the quote, like, hey, our games don't perform that well and blah, 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 right? And, uh, and the person said, yeah, that's true, right? Like, it's difficult for us to figure out how to, how to do stuff on the Switch. And I said, well, how about making a game for the Switch rather than right. porting something that is arguably the worst version of the bunch for this platform and in, in many cases is like last year's version. And I said, why don't you do something like, uh, you know, like Plants vs. Zombies that seems to fit on this platform a little bit better than, you know, a Madden or FIFA. And, like, the person kind of winked, winked, 
nudged nudged at me a little bit. And so um, I'm hoping that this is not EA's story on the Switch and that we will see something like uh, a PVZ that actually belongs. If they keep up this sort of publishing, EA won't have a story on the Switch, right? That's that's the bottom line. It's like if people stop buying games on the Switch, EA will pull out entirely and just say like, hey, this isn't a platform that we want to support anymore because our games don't make any money there. It's a a vicious circle, right? Like Mm -hmm. they're not going to put the quality into their games to port to the Switch. People aren't going to buy them. The, the, The other, the flip side of the coin is like, it's not a bad game, right? Like the FIFA games are still good. They're enjoyable to play, but if you had 19, then 20 is a ripoff if you mm. bought it for full price. Like sure. that's yeah. it. It replacing 19, it's still a good game. It's just, you know, like arguably these so- these sports games that are iterative every year, like you don't want to be caught with a five-year-old version and like FIFA 19 was already FIFA 18. So, you know, <laughs> it is Bummer. getting less good because the other games are getting better. Sure. So we all know that the, there's going to be a Nintendo theme section in Universal Orlando, um, Universal Studios in Orlando, Florida, uh, but there's also going to be a Super Nintendo World theme park in Universal Studios Japan, and we actually got a glimpse of something, some decorations that look like from Super Mario 3D World. So if you want to check that out, we have an article up about it. It looks pretty cool. It hmm. just looks like some some towers that looked like from a Super Mario 3D World with some moving clouds. We have no idea what it is, but it's yeah. there. I'm so curious as to what this peak. attraction is actually going to be. If it's I like no idea rides or full contact obstacle course. That's the thing. It's like is it like I a big it. obstacle I'd course with just like everything? No, they have rides. Trampolines built in everywhere, so you can like jump over oh, stuff. Oh, that's like, so yeah. exciting! I would want that. Can you imagine the waivers you'd have to sign to oh, yeah. attend that? Yeah, I would yeah. sign anything. If you get on the <laughs> Mario Kart ride, let us you, test um, it. You you drive up to a little gate. You have to give them five bucks, but you can come back for a month. For, <laughs> no, for a month, you just have to pay an <gasps> fee. Right, right. No, uh, no they, they have a mixture of parks and experiences. They've been pretty vocal about that stuff. Um, I I think it looks really cool. I, yeah, I think it yeah, looks, I think it looks amazing. Like, this is you can tell they're working closely with Nintendo, and it's not like a cheap knockoff right. version. It looks like. It looks like Nintendo's E3 displays, like that kind of lovingly crafted stuff that actually looks like the the blocks done in 3D or like what they did for um, Link's Awakening. Mm-hmm. I think it looks. Has awesome. anybody been to the Wizarding World of Harry Potter? Yes. Yes. So that just looks like Harry Potter. Yeah. Like Universal's ability to craft these like uh, total escapist, like amazing landscapes within yeah. their own theme parks is kind of unprecedented i mean i i guess disney does a really good job of it as well yeah. with like galaxy's edge and stuff but these kind of immersive experiences are all the rage with the theme parks now and i think that like mario one could be potentially yeah, really cool be the new toontown now uh tr- true or false you're planning on getting married at the one in orlando correct the uh-huh. super oh, mario yeah. world yep. yeah next, that's next what year. i thought okay no cool. wait whenever it's open that's congratulations we're just gonna go the first yeah. day i figured she <laughs> would go to a volcano or something <laughs> that seems more like casey yeah Tell me, tell me where the nearest volcano is, and I'll go. Hawaii. Someone pay f- for me to go to a volcano. Maybe there's one in. Maybe there's one in like Southern North, California. like Lake oh, Tahoe, North, like yeah. no, like what's it, Lassen yeah. County, Mount Lassen, 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 yeah. Mount Hood, giant, isn't there a, giant volcano underneath. Isn't there an active volcano in Yellowstone? Oh, the whole thing is a volcano. Oh yeah, and if it blows up, <laughs> we're remember all the great going to die with Pierce Brosnan. Vo- a volcano. Volcano. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Welcome to Nintendo Volcano Chat. All of California <laughs> is a volcano. Yeah. So tread tread lightly, guys. And in other news, the Overwatch director says the Nintendo can have any character for Smash, and they spe- he specifically said to the Smash Brothers team, whatever character you want, we love them all. They're all our babies. You can have any single one of them. We have thirty one to choose from. But I think they specifically pointed out to Tracer as yeah. The, yeah. the favorite yeah. choice for that. Tracer, like being a fan favorite, would. Make- well, she's Tracer's like the also mascot. like the Overwatch mascot, yeah. and I think th- there was a rumor for a while that Tracer was going to be the character that was yep. revealed when Terry Bogart was revealed. If anything, I think this statement kind of proves that's not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But also, it's an, it's cool. It's not it's not indicative of anything. It's not it shouldn't be taken as like some sort of thing that's being worked on or anything like that. But it's just nice to see that and like very transparently be like, yeah, we love Smash Bros. Put them in, right. do it, mm-hmm. go. But I love I love the idea of Tracer like having ultimate abilities and her abilities from the game where like you get knocked off the course and then you just rewind and mm-hmm. like pop back up on, or, or like you well, yeah, they y- you build up a meter stuff. enough during the, the fight that you can like warp to somebody stick a bomb on them that just automatically shoots them off the stage like I think that I think she'd make a really great fighter mm-hmm. I, I love these glimpses at the rest of the development community like where you see like what special place 
Nintendo has in their, in their hearts, right? You know the teams working on these big shooters and, you know, big online games. After they're done working, they're all sitting down and they're playing Smash, right? Like that. Yeah. Like, I mean, you don't that, know that, but you hope that. Like, we know I mean, it. 100%. I've seen the stations at the development studios. There's there's a Smash there's a Smash Bros in every development studio. <laughs> there's a little Smash Bros um, in all of us. And I, I think that's so cool. And like for them to be fans to want to have their characters included is just so cool. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Mitchell Saltzman, for that original reporting. He's yeah. our yeah. co-worker who's really into Smash and also a whole bunch of other games. Yep. Very cool. And in other news, which isn't nice, um, Alpha Dream <laughs> <laughs> files for bankruptcy. Um, they're the developers of the Mario and Luigi RPG series, like Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga, Bowser's Inside Story, and, and some other games. And uh, Logan Plant, our assistant, pointed out that they also made him Taro Ham Ham games on Game Boy Advance. That's right. <sighs> Did you play those? Yeah. Oh, were they good? I don't. I never remember played them. I don't remember. Probably, no. I was a child. Was cute, but <laughs> they have. They had a couple of games that were just made for Japan, so they're mm -hmm. not just a, a Mario and Luigi shop. Mm -hmm. But obviously nothing that really blew up and, yeah, it's a bummer. and paid the yeah. bills. This is sad news to me. I really like the Mario and Luigi series because it was genuinely like laugh out loud funny. Yeah. Like some of the localization on the on those games is like really wonderful. I think Fawful is like an all time great villain in video games. Um, and it, it is sad to see them go because it is different from Paper Mario in a way that is like pretty unique, but borrows enough from the from original Mario RPG to kind of be like a successor to that. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a bummer to see them go because I would have liked to have seen the last thing they did was a remastered port for what Bowser's was it? Bowser's Inside, Inside Story. Story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I would have loved to have seen a new Mario and Luigi game. Yeah, and the Alpha Dream was a was a bunch of Square Enix veterans, so people who worked specifically on Square RPGs when they uh, before they founded the studio, and like you can tell that they put their stamp on on Mario RPG to make Mario and Luigi a different game, which mm -hmm. I really appreciated. So it's like. They're not a port house like somebody where Nintendo went and gave them the blueprints. They, they are you know they're basically the like you know the instrumental in creating. I, I weirdly series. always saw them as kind of akin to how lab how laboratories, whereas mm -hmm. like they were doing their own thing, but sort of under Nintendo's eye and yeah, almost like a like a second party development. Yeah, they're right? like these. They're they're a couple of these small studios like going way back, Mario Ghoul and Monolith. Like Brownie Brown, like these smaller studios. Yeah. Like Monolith got pretty big, right? Right. These smaller studios that put their special stamp on like some Nintendo franchises or you know Square Enix Ape. franchises, whatever. Yeah, that's a good one yeah. too. And lastly, the Ring Fit Adventure preview is up right now. You can go check that out by Jonathan Dornbush and his initial impressions on it. Um, he says it's mainly a tool for fitness with an RPG rather than an RPG with some fitness elements. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, he did come back from that preview event just ripped. He looked though. ginormous. <laughs> yeah. uh, really strong now. Put on like three inches on each bicep. That's right. kind no, of we've insane. got a video with Josh Dew doing it too, right? Mm -hmm. Like Josh was playing it. Uh, yeah. Josh is on your team. Yeah. Um, Josh said that he like legitimately felt l like like he had a workout the next day. Well, he starts and he's wearing a sweater, and then like the <laughs> next shot, the sweater is gone. The next shot, the shirt is gone. Well, that might have been by design. <laughs> I but see. yeah, Jonathan uh, Jonathan said that he's been playing about thirty minutes every day, and that Ring Fit Adventure has been estimating his calorie burned. Uh, calories burned to be around like 150, but his Apple Watch has been in the 200s. That's nothing. That's nothing. But yeah. for, th for 30 minutes, though, it's 30 pretty, minutes that's of average. playing a video game. Like, yeah, not bad. You'd be surprised how much how much you have to run to work off one cookie. It's yeah, kind well, of insane. Yeah, well, that's one Coke, right? 150 yeah. is one. Uh, a, an eight ounce non serving non of denominational Coke. soft drink. <laughs> Pepsi too. Um, Non-denominational soft drink. Yeah. A cookie. Not Still, a it's 150 more calories burned than you. No, have. you're right. Mm -hmm. And uh, like. If it becomes a habit and you do this every day, obviously it's pretty meaningful. Mm -hmm. uh, but more more importantly, is it fun, right? I, yeah. I haven't been able to play this yet. I've seen the ring uh, and messed around with it yeah. and mostly used it for evil. Um, <laughs> I'm kind of torn. I'm thinking, like, should I pick it up? Should I buy it? it? The ring feels, it felt a lot more durable and flexible than I expected it to and much higher quality than your average Pilates ring that you will encounter in your local gym. So. I don't know what that is. Um Josh said that he was actually really impressed with like how much of a game the mm -hmm. actual game portion of it is. Like he was okay. he was saying that it's like yeah, that's like a legitimate action RPG that you're playing with this goofy controller. Like mm -hmm. he's, you know, he said like outside of the workout stuff, he was like it actually seems like a pretty cool game. Like, hmm. Jonathan said that you 
can equip your character with clothes that change your stats and you can uh, get ingredients to make smoothies that change your stats. Is it all stuff. fitness clothes? Is it all it's, like workout I, That's what it sounds they like, have, right? I haven't really seen funny. it yet. It's almost like the Pikmin juice animations uh -huh. for the smoothie stuff. Did you see that? <laughs> no, Stop that's it. pretty good. Like Nintendo loves making juice, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's pretty funny. Uh, I The one thing I really liked about Ring Fit Adventure that I saw is that they use the IR sensor on the Joy-Con. One of the Joy-Con has an IR sensor. They use it to measure your heartbeat. Mm. Oh, oh, cool. How cool yeah, is you that? Put that your is thumb really over it, cool. Yeah, right? That's such a good idea. Wow. Like they just cut they they keep on coming up with new uses for that thing. Like also new ways to measure your heartbeat on Nintendo hardware. It's yeah. so crazy. <laughs> but very cool. So look for that full preview on IGN.com. It should be up right now. Are you guys gonna play it? Anybody? I'm yeah, I'll play absolutely it. going to play it. I originally I, um sorry. You go ahead. Oh, I, I think we're about to tell the same story. No, right, I was go gonna ahead. say I originally wanted to review it, <laughs> but I was out of town uh, <laughs> this Monday and Tuesday, so you I couldn't usurped it. Yeah, it got usurped. Uh, I, I also volunteered to review it because I thought it'd be really funny just to do the video review. But um, Dan was like, you have to fight Casey for it. And I was like, I don't want to fight Casey oh. for it. Yeah. I think it makes and sense, Jonathan though, that whoever, whoever can win the fight gets to review the fitness <laughs> thing. That's right. That's yeah, well, he said to arm wrestle her for it. So yeah. I would have definitely lost that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You're a boy. You have advantage. Your arms leverage, man. Look how short yeah, the arms are Yeah, your arm is also like a foot longer. <laughs> It's all well, about leverage. very comically stretched lengthwise, <laughs> this man. First the butt candy and now the comical <laughs> stretching. Like, I feel like you got a personal vendetta out for me this week, Pear. Enjoy your candy. That's okay. almost gone. <laughs> Let's talk about games out this week. And the first one we're going to talk about is 80 Days out on October 1st. The original review got a 9 out of 10. Don't call it a comeback. <laughs> Tom. Yeah. <laughs> Why did you say yay? <laughs> Sorry, 80 Days Rules. Uh, if anybody hasn't played 80 Days yet, you should really look out for this one. It's a, uh, a, a kind of choose-your-own-adventure yeah. RPG, little, little, little bits of RPG elements in it. Um, originally was for mobile, I believe. Like forever Like ago. a million years ago. Yeah, I played uh, this on, on mobile like 2013 or something. Yeah, Maybe and even it's... It's based on the story around the world in 80 days, yeah. but the way the Yay. game works is you start in, I think it's London, and you basically just pick your paths, and you go to cities, and you visit there, and you should really think of it as like an interactive novel in a lot of ways, because the writing is really good, um, and you're going to go to these cities, and if you're sort of just like impatiently trying to get around the world, you're not going to get, like that's not what this game is about, it's about going to these cities and like it gives you an opportunity to just explore and like learn the stories and meet people and have these really cool interactions. And then every time you play it, it only takes you a few hours to beat. And then every time you play it, you can go a completely different path and see completely mm. different stories. Cool, super cool. There's just a really cool. ton of spider webbing paths to go down. Have you not played this? No, I'm oh, I I'm a Vernon head though. I love, I, I I love yeah. novel. Yeah, yeah novel I figured you, you would have played this because no, this I is didn't. this is a pair game. We you would like it a lot. Yeah. Right. Of course, the disclosure of we haven't actually played it on Switch, Switch yet, yeah. so we don't know what the quality of that is, but mm -hmm. the game itself is just so fun if you're into just sort of choose your own adventure style things. Yeah, I will say this is $13 on Switch. Too high. It's a little high. I wish that it was like five. It's a little high yeah. for such an old game, but yeah. it is a very, very good game. Okay. Unless there's like some real quality of life stuff, mm. but yeah. And we also got a Super Crate Box out on the first as well for $5. This is a game I'm unfamiliar with. Uh, it's a cool little shoot 'em up game from Vlambeer, uh, which okay. is oh. Nuclear Throne. Yeah. It's one of their kind of oldie but goodie claim to fame mm. games. Um, really small arcadey, just like high score attack game. Uh, just want to check out. Cool. And we have Neocab out on October 3rd. I played this game at GDC, and I really liked what I played. It's kind of visual novelty where you choose different options when talking to people that you are. You're basically an Uber driver in like a future dystopian San Francisco um, <laughs> where most Uber drivers have been replaced by self-driving cars. <laughs> and um, it has kind of a lot of commentary on the city itself, I think. But I really enjoyed what I played. It's pretty cool. Kind of Wait. cyber funky. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we have Ghostbusters, the video game remastered out on, on the 4th. Yeah, um, it's a really weird game to remaster and bring out now, I think. But uh, it's October, it's spooky month. Yeah, it's a... It's yeah. a and it's, there'll be more Ghostbusters coming next year. Yeah, I guess so. It's not really a, like a spooky game, but it, it's funny because like this game, when it was released, was like a solid 7. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> gameplay-wise, like fine, nothing to Good. write home about. Good. Um, but... 
the I think the real claim to fame is like it was the f- first project to finally reunite the original Ghostbusters cast, mm-hmm. and it was written by a lot of them, so it's got a really similar tone. Even though Bill Murray sounds like he recorded all his VO like half asleep, <laughs> but like it, it's a pretty fun game. And as a big Ghostbusters fan, I remember being really excited for a lot of the stuff that you yeah. could do. I might pick this up on the I like Switch to just it. for it brought back just over a little stroll down memory lane. Remember, I I I grew up with the uh, the first wave of home computers, so Commodore sixty four. I had an Atari XL computer and uh, played Ghostbusters, the original oh, yeah. game, which was so cool. Like the mm-hmm. music was so awesome. And so when this game first came out, it was I, I wanted that experience again. It was I thought it was good. Yeah, I thought it was a good game. It wasn't amazing, but it was good. So those games are out now mm-hmm. or will be soon. Mm-hmm. But what are we playing now? Zach, I know. I, yeah, I want you to start because I want to talk about Dragon Quest. Dragon Quest, baby! <laughs> Which one? Oh, Dragon Quest Eleven. Oh. It is very good. I'm only yes. yes I'm only about four hours in. Um, not a huge Dragon Quest boy previously. I've only okay. played eight. Um, but uh, I downloaded the demo for Dragon Quest Eleven in that weird in-between time. I had finished Fire Emblem, but Link's Awakening wasn't out, and I had just finished Control. And so I, uh, on a whim one night, I was like, oh, I'll give this a shot. Totally sucked me in. Uh, I, great. I, yeah, it's awesome. Like, beautiful to look at on the Switch. Uh, I think it's really funny, the conversation around this version is that, the, you know, it's called the definitive version, but there are so many added things on the Switch version that aren't in the other console versions. Like, you've got a symphonic score. You have full Japanese voice acting, which wasn't uh, available on the other consoles. Mm. So, like, the, the Japanese version that came out in 2017 had no voice acting at all. Then they added English voice acting for the American release, and then they went back and added Japanese voice acting for this release. So uh, Dragon Quest purists, like our friend Jared Petty, is very excited about that. Greetings. Oh, uh, and then you've got uh, the 2D version. So you can play you can, at any time. You can go to a save point and switch to the 2D version and make it just like a 16-bit RPG, which is great. It's so I yeah, love it. It's really crazy cool. That they did that. Yeah. Really great. It's really funny though, because like it's still a 16-bit RPG until you like walk into a cutscene and then it goes into the full like 3D thing. <laughs> but like it's really funny. Like the, the character design is Akira Toriyama of Dragon Ball fame, of Dragon Quest fame, I guess. Um, so it looks beautiful. It's it's like the best way that I can describe it is like when you're playing 16-bit RPGs as a kid on your Super Nintendo, in your mind, this is what that those games look like, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, so um the realization of that is is really really great, and it's it's not like it's not this amazing leap forward like Persona Five was. I feel like, but it does have a really interesting battle system, kind of reminiscent of Final Fantasy XII. Um, and I just I'm really loving my time with it. Yeah, I've I, I haven't picked it up yet, but I um I'm planning to play it as well. I yeah, same. really enjoy the the Dragon Quest games. You know, I I was originally a Final Fantasy kid. Kid came to the Dragon Quest games pretty late, mm-hmm. um, you know, but still in Japan, played them on the Super Famicom and uh, really liked them. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this one. Yeah, this is a really cool game. And if you have the demo, one of the nicest things is like I booted up the the full version and it asked like, hey, we recognize that you have some yes. save uh, data from the demo. Would you like to import that? So I didn't have to start over, which was so great. That's perfect. Like, yeah. 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 Anybody awesome. on the fence, just play the demo. Yeah. And you can play that demo for up to 10 hours before what? it cuts you off. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. Because I, I was playing the demo and I just like I kept going to new areas. I was like, what the heck's happening here? And then finally, like I looked it up. It's like, yeah, you can play up to 10 hours. Wow. Yeah. That's it's like insane. the uh, the Octopath demo yeah. all yeah. the way back where it was like, congrats, you finished the demo and then just lets you keep playing the game. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> well, that I think that limited you to an hour. Right. But it, it was so funny that it just like kind of yeah. kept going after. Mm-hmm. So if you yeah. sped run, speed run. He ran through it. Spud run. Spud run. Yes. Yeah. That one. Spud ran. Tom, what are you playing? Kind of a lot of stuff. I beat Link's Awakening this weekend. Okay. Yeah, which me too. I was very happy uh, about. Last weekend. Yeah. Um, I've been playing a lot of Slay the Spire. I've been playing a lot of things not on Switch. Like I beat Control, which was definitely one of my favorite games of the that. year. I have to play that. Really, really good. good. Um, really interesting game. The one thing I'll call out is uh, I got a chance to play Bra- the Bradwell Conspiracy, which is this sort of portal-inspired, like, not directly inspired by it. It's, it's kind of maybe a little too general vague to say portal-inspired. It's a first-person puzzle game with kind of story-driven uh, 
but there's not portals. Instead, you have this gun called the matter something matter creation device or something like that. Um, and you, it's basically like a 3D printer that's mobile, and you can absorb matter cool. into it and then nice. print out items. Uh -huh. uh, and then there's also this photo mechanic where you're talking to this other person on the end of these like smart glasses, and the only way you can talk is you can't speak. Uh, the only way you can communicate with them is by taking pictures of the world around you, and then depending on what you're looking at the character will respond to you. So if you take a picture of like a photo, maybe she'll explain something about the photo. Or if you take a picture of a puzzle, she'll give you a clue. There's some solutions where you have to take a picture of a locked door and then she'll be like, oh, I can open that for you. Like, give me a oh, sec. Neat. Um, yeah, that comes out on Switch. It just got a release date on Wednesday. So it comes out, I think on the 10th on Switch, oh. October 10th. So it's right around the corner. Um, and it was totally not on my radar. And it, really really is a cool game nice. so i'm excited to keep playing more of that and i'm excited to uh to see what the full game is like want to keep an eye on definitely if you're a fan of stuff like the talus principle or the witness or portal or I like sort of any yes yeah, sort yeah. of any of those games yeah yeah it's a cool one that's great here uh i just downloaded bastion on uh, switch because oh. it was on sale for three bucks so why not Bastion's so good it is happy to $3? have that game on, it was on 2.99 man three dollars for bastion great? is one of the most insane i know value that's a great deal so things. even though i already own it i'm like i got i gotta own it again now yeah. i'm just on the go so yeah. i'm gonna start playing it but uh you know on my travels to japan long flights i was able to uh, obviously um play, beat Link's awakening mm -hmm. uh love that game very very enjoyable um i'm gonna go back and get just the last two hard containers <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. goose game which i know you guys talked uh, a ton about love that game every game needs a spread your wings to taunt button it's just the best <laughs> thing like nothing gift that oh it's so good <laughs> uh and then because of the nvc facebook group and like a lot of the feedback that we've been get, uh, getting i started xenoblade 2 oh um Thank you, thank you. I, I will be, went so I'll far. be the lone expert on this panel who actually finished it. I haven't finished it yet. Uh, it's really good. I, I'm really digging it. Um, uh, I, it. It is one of the more impressive games conceptually on the platform, just with the kind of the number of systems and the world that they've created. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to playing more. Um, but I, I've, I've the English actually, voice acting annoyed me. I had to switch yeah. back to... to I have to it's download the Japanese language. The five-ish hours that I played, I played in Japanese for that same reason. But I, I've actually... So the episode about the last Nintendo Direct when they announced that the original Xenoblade yeah. Chronicles was coming to Switch, we saw a lot of comments that were like, oh, the first one is even better than the second one. Yeah. You know, like, this is, like, one of the best JRPGs of all time. And I had put in the Facebook group that I was going to play that one when it comes out. So you and I can be... Yeah, co -ex No, I'll definitely <laughs> play play one when it comes on the out on Switch too. Do the thing. But yeah, great, great recommendation. Thank you. It came out when I was way too busy to play it, so now hopefully I can find some time. And now it's time for Zach's favorite game, Question Block. I don't think that's a game. We're gonna have this conversation every single time for the rest of all time, so we hope you never get tired of it. And if you do, uh, just keep it to yourself. It's a very <laughs> good. It's a very good joke. <laughs> So first up from Bo Carnegie, he says, I recently started playing Final Fantasy VIII. I remember Zachary Ryan speaking highly of it, That's so me. figured it was a good time. It's by no means a bad game, but I'm having a hard time finding that. I can't wait to get back to playing it, Groove, which is uncommon for Final Fantasy games. I can't put my finger on exactly why. Is there a core game that's part of your favorite gaming franchise that you just can't get into? And if so, why? So I will say Final Fantasy VIII is definitely the black sheep of that series. And a lot of people feel that way, that it's like the odd man out. So it doesn't surprise me that Bo's having a hard time like get hitting that rhythm. And it doesn't really pick up until like pretty... like probably 10 to 15 hours in when you learn all the like weird, really weird level mechanics in that game. Um, to answer the question though, I actually am kind of feeling this way about Link's Awakening right now. Wow. I, I mean, I love Link's Awakening. It's one of my favorite games, mm -hmm. but I played through the face shrine last weekend and that dungeon is so tedious and mm -hmm. so backtracky. And I know that the Eagle's tower is the same way. The next dungeon, um, having played it multiple times over. And it like, I just found myself thinking like, I get that this is a one-to-one -one remake, but there are quality of life things that could have been done here to make these dungeons more accessible or a little bit. And I know people in the comments are already typing furiously about, ah, you know, I don't like the game. It's not true. I think it's an amazing game. It's just like that; those dungeons in particular 
show the age of that game pretty well. I can like, say the over the overworld map does too, right? Like I appreciate the warp system and the fast travel, but like put down a point in the vid village for me to fast travel to the library seriously. Or the store or the yeah. cover machine, right? Like there are a couple of things like it is a very labyrinth like setup that that takes more time to to yep. walk around than like a link to the past where once you get the hammer you just kind of like mm -hmm. cut through all these different places. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to lie, I'll jump on this grenade for you. I up until probably past the third dungeon i thought it was a bad game like i oh. i was really not really? liking it like uh, the door is just this way thomas like, genuinely disliking it and oh, wow. like to the point where i didn't even know if i was going to finish it but i love Ooh. zelda games so much that i just kept playing uh, have you not I, had you not played it before no i'd never played oh, it oh and goodness. so i re <laughs> i i did get to the end and by the end of it i i really love it like i really really okay, do good. enjoy it uh -huh. um but i think that there are a lot of parts of that game no matter how well they remade it because they did do a wonderful job remaking it there are a lot of parts of that game that feel like they were designed for game boy in 1993 exactly and there's no way to get around that yeah, well, and those were. are frustrating yeah. and like there's that part of it hit me like i hit a wall with that and i pushed through it i'm really glad i did push through it but yeah i, I understand what you're saying yeah some of those dungeons have a lot of backtracking I feel very claustrophobic in kind of their layouts the overworld especially and there was just so much charming beyond that that kept me yeah. going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, also, like, side note, stop talking about the frame rate in that game. It's not that bad. Uh, like, it was far worse than I thought it was going to be. I it's, it's, it's not it's not good for a first-party Nintendo game, but the way that people are talking to me about it is like, oh, also, the frame rate is so terrible. And it's like, it's it not that bad. It doesn't, it's it doesn't fine. destroy the experience. It's just like the world it's, looks so, like, cutesy realistic, and then it takes you out of it when, when the mm. screen I think people up. are also yeah. just shocked to see that kind of slow down in a first party Nintendo well, you should mm -hmm. have been alive during the N64 age yeah no kidding of slow down yeah. and like Ocarina of Time and stuff but uh, I had difficulty getting into a Final Fantasy 8 but if you talk about core Nintendo franchise uh, the door is just this way pair <laughs> Kirby Air Ride Ooh. to this day <laughs> No, like there were so many That's people who loved that game. Kirby Air Ride, like I just couldn't get into it. And then I was confounded when my kids, after they were born, the game I think came out before they were born, when they were totally into it. They loved that game. I'm like, what are you guys doing? They played it all it's day so long. So simple. Kids, yeah, yeah. That, that doesn't surprise me. You hate Kirby so much. No, I love, I no, love Kirby. Kirby's really, my favorite. Oh. I even buy snacks based on Kirby. <laughs> for, for me, it was probably Skyward Sword. I just couldn't get okay. over the motion controls. I just did not like them. They did not click with me, and it made me want to quit. Altano told me the other day that that's the only Zelda game that he's never finished. Yeah, I, have, I was I so surprised by that. Which is a shame because like, it wraps up really well. It does. Yeah, I'd say the last third of that game is pretty good. But Great. the last time, I it's the only Zelda game that I've only uh, played once. It has so. it has a really nice story. Like it, there's yeah. a and the there's story some is really great. clever puzzles. Like the whole like time crystal thing that you push like there's some great stuff um but yeah it has some issues there's a moment in that game where you go back to the the woods and you have to search for all these like musical notes mm -hmm. and they like submerge the woods in waters and that was for me my second playthrough a couple years after it came out i was like okay i'm done like <laughs> i'm not like doing a lot all of this older like zelda games have that though like wind waker had that quest too that they smoothed out for for the hd re-release and like i feel like take another stab at skyward sword redo it and, and clean it up a little bit <laughs> nintendo huh? and uh, take the stupid musical note quest out. yeah I, I feel like i actually had a lot of people talking to me about that in uh on twitter this week of like every zelda has one thing about it that is like or one dungeon or one aspect that like is not great the yeah. tears and then uh twilight, twilight princess. princess right yeah. like ocarina of except Time. for wind waker wind waker is a perfect game but well mm. now after they now fixed it. the hd yeah. version did. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Majora's Mask had those <laughs> those race sections. Where Tom still calls it Zelda. <laughs> I would I would uh, I would argue, and this is something I have argued before, that the entire second half of Wind Waker, with all the like Triforce piece collecting, drags. Like, there's not much to that section. They fixed it. For they the fixed Wii. it for HD. Yeah, just because you can go faster. I did no. play the HD. No, version. no they, they, they changed they, it. They shrunk down the amount of Triforce pieces that you have to collect yeah. in the second half, so it's much shorter. How many were there before? I think you have to collect. I think you have to collect eight in the original, and in the new one, I think it's only five. Yeah. They, really? Uh, I yeah. played the HD remake, and I 
thought no, it was it's, so it's yeah no, they, no, they, they truncate that it. quest they, mm. there were like additional quests where you had to like you you had to shoot the cannon boat you yeah. had to go into that mm. little aisle like they they mm. kind of condensed them and they actually even the american version was a step up from the japanese version the japanese version did not mark any completed triforce pieces on your map oh. so you did you were like wait do i still have to do uh. the boat or not like it was very confusing yeah, yeah. Well, they, they changed some things for the better, but they also ruined it in other ways, which made it unplayable. Oh, here we for go. Me. Here we go. <laughs> they removed the inverted no controls. No inverted camera. So, can't play that game. Baby mode. <laughs> no, it's just how it was originally made. They. <laughs> <laughs> it was the original controls pair, and that's what well, I'm used do to, an and that's what I want to freaking just for play. You yeah. On Switch. Uh, yeah. How could they do that? Yeah. Um, anyway. <laughs> do one more. Do one more. I know we're over time. Yeah, we're over time. So uh, from Steven Milardovich, how often do you complete a game 100% with so many great games coming out all the time? I rarely complete all of the little extras anymore. Never. Yeah, I, huh. I, and unless I'm like really, really, really into a game, I barely ever do 100%. Like I'll go back and do a lot of extras, but like there was no part of me that felt like I needed to get all the Korok seeds, right? Like no, that, no, that no, sort no, of thing. No, absolutely not. Yeah. No. I usually 100% Zelda games, but I did not go after all the Korok, Korok seeds. I did everything else in that game, the max you could do, but left a few Korok seeds for all the other kids. Um, but I, I do complete uh, uh, like some of the some open world games. I'll do everything like God of War I did on the other platforms, mm. uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. I, oh my gosh. I thought that was an awesome game. But you 100%ed yeah. Assassin's Creed Odyssey? It's not that Jesus. hard. Jesus. Isn't it like 300 hours? It was really long. <laughs> <laughs> I really like that game. I have no opinion it's on that really, game. Really, really good. But like, but uh, obviously, um, some of the some of the Nintendo platformers too. Like, they're not like three hundred hour games. Mm -hmm. But Wh if you Witcher, do, I did Witcher three. I did one hundred percent. If you do want one hundred percent something like uh, Super Mario Odyssey or The Legend of Zelda: Breath of the Wild, we have some really handy maps oh, on our wiki wow. pages. Oh wow! With uh, them marked off, and we have that question. this really cool checklist feature where you can check, you can log in and then check mark as you get them, so you can keep track. Are we gonna do that for the seashells for? Link We're gonna do that for seashells and the heart pieces. We're in the process of doing that right That's now. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, one more question, super quick. From TJ Rankin, what truly scary game do you recommend to get in the Halloween mood? Uh, Resident Evil Remake. Uh, PT. PT? Ah. PT. It's still on my PlayStation. Not on mine. Uh, I just started playing it because I like control so much, so I'll say Alan Wake. Okay. Oh, okay. I love Alan Wake. Alan Wake's pretty yeah. good. Yeah, it's really good. Spooky games. So thank you so much for watching and or listening. Remember, you can always watch NBC or listen to NBC on your favorite podcasting platform, IGN.com or YouTube. Rem thank you, Zach Ryan and Tom Marks and Pear Snyder. Thank you. Where can they find you all? Pear uh, on Twitter. At Zach ISD on Twitter. Uh, at Tom R. Marks. And you can find me on Twitter at ShinyKCD. Thank you so much for watching and or listening. And remember, this is the only place you can get, get the, the thing. thing.